Thanks, everybody, for coming out today. The, uh, I was glad to see that it wasn't sunny. <laughs> okay, this is the biggest crowd I'm going to get because it's miserable unless you're a skier. And I, I would actually be skiing if I wasn't doing this. So, uh, My name's Terry Rich. I recognize most of you. Uh, I think I've seen you at one of my talks or at some other birding events uh, in the not too distant past. Um, I worked for the Bureau of Land Management for 20 years. Uh, for the last uh, 10 of that, I was their, their lead non-game bird person working for the Washington office, even though I was located here in Boise, so it was a, a really good uh, arrangement for me. And then in 2000, I went over to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and coordinated a partnership called Partners in Flight from 2000 to 2014. And then I retired, but I've stayed involved in um, birding and bird conservation and doing things like this uh, since that time. So uh, I actually put this workshop together for the Hagerman Bird Festival, and then they canceled it or moved it. And I thought, wow, I've got this kind of nice, I think, set of stuff on sparrows for three hours, or probably won't go quite three hours. Uh, I should go ahead and try to offer it somewhere and see if anybody is interested. So I thank uh, Vicki for giving us the space and for coming out on a Saturday to get us teed up. And uh, th again, thanks for, for coming to see how this goes. All right, sparrows. Uh, I actually have, a, I think, a kind of a good story to start this off. So I grew up in this little town in Wisconsin, Baraboo, Wisconsin, about uh, 7,000 people. And uh, my dad was an amateur botanist, and we used to go camp and especially hike. We hiked a lot in the hills and in the forests around where I grew up, around Baraboo, Devil's Lake, Wisconsin Dells. And uh, one day I was looking out the window of our house at this bird, and I said, Dad, there's this, what is this bird? And he's like, going, he's rolling his eyes, he's going, oh my God. <laughs> but it was literally the first time I like looked at and saw a bird. I mean, like, really looked at it and saw it. And I was like, what is this? It's really beautiful. What is it? And well, of course, and he's like, it's a house sparrow. <laughs> you know, it's an exotic species. They've, they're here all the time. Uh, but I literally had not. So I thought it was kind of interesting when I was thinking about this workshop that my first sort of eye-opening moment in bird world where I've spent my whole life was a house sparrow. So there you go. Uh, I did my master's on what used to be called the sage sparrow, forever gone now. It's now the sage brush sparrow. So that was over at Idaho State in uh, 1977. I spent two field seasons uh, out in the sagebrush working on uh, studying the behavior of sage sparrows. So I've got, sage, I've got sparrows kind of along the way in my blood, I guess, or in my DNA. And I made my first Gmail address, Amphispiza, after the sage sparrow. And to this day, my wife keeps saying, why don't you get a name that somebody can spell? Because <laughs> I have to spell it out for everybody who's not a birder, right? But yeah, it's not, I'm keeping it. You know, I got Amphispiza, and that's mine. Uh, as I was looking around, I found this, just by chance, this hilarious thing. You may remember Andy Rooney. All birds look like sparrows to me. There are big sparrows and small sparrows and gaily colored sparrows, but they all look like sparrows. Last summer, I realized this was a know-nothing attitude, so I bought two bird books. They were filled with every conceivable kind of sparrow. So <laughs> it just shows you that you can only take a person so far down the road, if they didn't want to go farther, they're just not going to go. But I thought that was pretty, pretty funny. Uh, as I was putting this together, a lot of these sparrows I know myself pretty well, but some I had to do a little sleuthing on because I don't see them that often. And the, of course, these two uh, sparrow guides, which I have here if you want to look at them in, in hard copy, um, have kind of all the detail you want, but they're a little bit out of date now, so the taxonomy has changed somewhat. And I found that this bird guide, which is my favorite field guide, by the way, uh, was actually quite a bit superior to the Sibley guides and to the other guides I had, my Peterson guides. Just the amount of text, the descriptors of winter plumages, subspecies, Varieties was really pretty good right, right in this field guide. So I'm, I'm making a little bit of a push for that uh, again. Uh, the other thing in passing is that 
they've added, updated or added like 700 graphics, including a whole bunch of subspecies maps in the back. So if you want to really get into song sparrows and fox sparrows and these sparrows that vary, again, the maps and the descriptions are all in this field guide. So um, really, really nice work. The, uh, so a couple of tools that I use a lot and I always really talk them up all about birds. A great place to go to get basic information and I pulled I think all of the range maps when I've got range maps for these species are all from all about birds and the nice thing about this website is that Cornell keeps it updated pretty much on the fly so uh, some of the maps I've had in the past are, are static and they drift out of date over time for example nature serves uh, but these these are really good place to get maps so those that's where those are coming from so sort of to show you where we're going with this, and we'll probably take a break maybe on the hour if this does go till five, we'll take a couple breaks. Um, first, what are sparrows? What species are in Idaho? Of course, gonna spend most of the time on the identification part. And I thought quite a bit about how to approach this, and I talked to some other people who hold sparrow workshops, one in Arizona. I couldn't get much information from anybody. I don't know if they don't wanna share their hard work or uh, what the deal was. So it's like, okay, I'm gonna do it like this. So. We're gonna look at plumage by age and by sex, and I'm gonna divide these birds into what I call unmistakable. Uh, you know, you can't miss identifying what it is. Uh, distinctive, those that have enough field marks that if you can see them, you should be able to figure it out. And then the confusing, and, and it's actually a fairly, I think, smaller set of sparrows than you might think that are actually in this sort of confusing category. So we'll do that. We'll spend some time on song and then a little bit less time on habitat, season of occurrence, abund abundance, and taxonomy. And of course, those are all, this one isn't so useful as you'll see, but you know, usually I think when we identify something, we use all these, all these cues at once in most cases. So we'll, t we'll take a little look at each one of those sets. So just a, a little quick background. Uh, sparrow comes from the Anglo-Saxon word sperwa, I guess, spirwa, which means flutterer, which is kind of interesting. I mean, I guess uh, a lot of sparrows kind of flutter when you flush them, then go back down. So I suppose that's reasonable. But of course, the old world sparrows are a different family, um, Passeridae, and ours are Passerellidae. So the old world sparrows, like the house sparrow, that got launched me on my sparrow career uh, is a different family than what our new New World sparrows are and know at 138 species, including some really interesting ones down into the Neotropics. So um, again, on the sort of the techie taxonomic end, uh, the AOU, or now the AOS, split this group from the Emberizidae just in 2017. So this is a very fresh taxonomy and most of this new taxonomy is coming from the fact that people are doing a lot of DNA analysis and you're able to do some really, instead of looking at, is it, how brown is it? You know, they're looking at actual numbers and measurements off the DNA. It's really, it's really uh, reorganizing the taxonomy of birds and a lot of other things to a, a more scientifically sound and less subjective uh, setting. Um, the, you know, when you say, okay, what sparrows are in Idaho? Come on in. Uh, wet sparrows are in Idaho. Uh, the, cl the classic place to go is the Birds of Idaho Field Checklist, which uh, was last updated in 2007. If you want to get a really current checklist of any, any place in the world, literally, that you might want to go, I really like Avabase. There's nothing like it. Uh, in this box, or this thing called checklist here, you can, I'm going, for example, going to Ghana in West Africa in a few weeks. I go in there and look at Ghana and it dumps out the very latest, and this is literally updated just about daily by Denis Lepage up in Canada. It's a, a stunning website. And then you can get your list of all the species that have been reported in that country, that state, that county, that region. There's all kinds of ways to build your list in Avabase. Uh, I'll just show you just one little deeper dive into Avabase. If you pick a spe uh, species, here's Song Sparrow, you will also get all the names for song sparrow in all the other languages where it has a name. Uh, you'll get the taxonomic history here and a whole bunch of more links up here. 
a map, eBird, Wikipedia, NatureServe, BirdLife, Flickr, audio, more links. So it's an absolute clearinghouse of information about uh, any bird you want to look at anywhere in the world. All right, so uh, the Passerella Day. So here are the species that are on the Avabase uh, and Idaho bird uh, checklists are in this family. And I decided to add just a couple more that are actually in different families because sometimes they're confused with sparrows. So we'll look at um, Lazuli buntings. The males are not typically confused with sparrows, but the young and females are. Uh, same for house and cast and finch, of course, house sparrow, and then a few in this group. And I, I just left snow bunting in there so because it, it gives you everybody some breathing room. It's so easy. So I'm just going to leave it in there. And every time it's like, I know that one. Now, if you go again, go back to this, and this is something Avabase does not have, is an assessment of how, how abundant the species is. So I looked at these that are, here's casual three to 10 records. That's in the history of the state, accidental one to two records in the history of the state or of a reporting, and decided that I'm not going to spend time on those. So I knocked out uh, Casson Sparrow, Lacant Sparrow, Clay Colored, Eastern Towhee, and these two long spurs. So it's not a very big list in the end when you look at uh, the sparrows and things that might be confused with sparrows. As I said, as I was thinking about how to organize this, um, I decided, okay, there's basically six, six ways I think about identifying sparrows. And I think, um, obviously, plumage is the only sort of cue that's absolute. I mean, if you, have a, if you have a Vesper Sparrow in Panama City in your hand, that's all you need. You're going to figure out what it is. You, know, there, you don't need anything else. So that's an absolute cue. The trouble is you often can't get such a great look at it. Um, and so I think song is actually the best cue, but of course the bird has to be singing. And if it's not singing, then you got nothing. Uh, habitat, as you know, is very helpful most of the year. And again, we're going to look at all of these factors for each species. Uh, season of occurrence is usually really helpful. Of course, we love the things that are here when they're not supposed to be. That's what everybody goes to look at. Uh, okay, abundance, too, very useful. I mean, if you see 100 sparrows in a group, it's probably not a sage sparrow. You know. And as I said, taxonomy in this group, they're, they're uh, it's not that helpful, and we'll look at that as well. That's the thing, like, is it long-tailed? Is it big-headed? Stuff like that. It's like, I don't, I don't think that's very helpful for me anyway. If you disagree on anything I say, speak up. And we'll pause the recording while that happens. <laughs> all right. So like I said, we usually use really all, uh, all of these six factors to identify my treasured, no longer sage, but sagebrush sparrow. Okay, so let's look at some field marks. Uh, here's one of my six grandkids right here with my uh, $2,400 binoculars. <laughs> so put, put the strap around the neck. That's step number one, all right? Uh, and this is just to remind me to talk about uh, optics. Uh, you know, I guess those of us who get really serious about birding go ahead and cough up bucks for uh, the top of the line uh, binoculars where they might be. I like Zeiss, but Swarovski's like us. There's some others that are really superb. And for things like sparrows, you know, if you don't get a good look at them and they're not singing, you're not going to be too happy. So uh, I think get the best optics you can afford, or even the best optics you can't afford. <laughs> and if you take care of them, they'll last the rest of your life, and you can pass them down to your kids, literally. Right, so uh, I'm all for getting good optics so that you have brightness, clarity through the lenses, and you can actually see uh, the tertial edging or whatever it is you're trying to you're trying to see. All right, so as I said, these are each organized in the same way. So we'll look at males and females and then immatures, and go from unmistakable to distinctive to readily confused in each of these groups and see see how this goes. So in my opinion, um, over half of these species that we're going to look at are unmistakable as adult males. So look at look how easy that is. Half of the birds are already don't have to worry about because you can't miss. We'll see if you, think, if you agree with me. And then we'll work our way through the other categories. And I'm going to kind of go in quiz mode on these 
not show you the name so we can have a chance for people to uh, yell out the names or uh, answer them in the privacy of your own mind. And then after that, then I won't go quiz mode because that t usually takes longer. So what are we looking at here? Anyone? Black-throated Black sparrow. And on these, uh, unless I say otherwise, the uh, males and females are the same. It's not the, not the case in every, for every species, for sure. Okay? Lark sparrow. Nobody has a head like this, and, when they, and they have these huge white tail corners. And they, when they're breeding, they tend to fly around a lot and sing and display and flat, flare that tail. Come on in. Flare that tail out, and you can see these tail spots um, even some distance off, if, if they're flying away, you can pick out lark sparrows. I saw uh, some flocks of them down in Texas last fall, quite a ways across the field, and before we even put our binoculars up, it's like, well, those are lark sparrows. So not only a very distinctive head, but a very distinctive tail. And we'll listen to their songs pretty distinctive as well. This one? Lark bunting. Lark bunting. Uh, when we get to the abundance, we'll see that these are not seen very often in Idaho. Although they're very, very common in northern Great, Great Plains. When I was up in, uh, I lived in North Dakota for seven years, and the breeding bird survey routes I did uh, in the prairie up there, I had, on one stop, I think I had 67 lark buntings. And they sing in the air. So these birds are all up in the air flying around singing. It's mind-blowing. If you get out to western North Dakota, uh, you got to get out of the the country that's plowed up, you got to get out into prairie or alfalfa fields, and these things are everywhere. So lark bunting, and we'll talk about where they are and how abundant they are in a little bit. Everybody knows this bird, right? Right, dark-eyed junco. Um, just to point out, there's a lot of variation in juncos, you know, that we used to have, I think when I was a kid, three species, slate colored. Oregon and white-winged in the Black Hills, and those were lumped quite a long time ago now. There's a really good article in Birdwatcher's Digest in the January-February 18 article that looks at the various forms of juncos, and in fact, these that are actually yellow-eyed, there are different species, yellow-eyed juncos and subspecies of yellow-eyed junco, and then a volcano junco, which is on, you can see on the volcanoes in Costa Rica, for example, and then coming back up through the prairies and over to your classic slate-colored. So a very nice article it talks about um, the plumage and where they are and how you tell them apart and what some of the issues are with the taxonomy. Bird Watchers Digest. Somebody's favorite bird, I heard it a minute ago. <laughs> right, white crowned. Golden crowned sparrow. Yay! We had one this uh, this fall. Ariel found out at the foothills. Harris's sparrow, white throats. Seems like there's always one at Hyatt Lakes in the winter, right? Very uh, abundant bird in the boreal forest and in the east. When I was back in Wisconsin this fall, I was running into flocks of 50 to 100 white-throated sparrows, pretty commonly along the Wisconsin River. So it was the, by far the most abundant sparrow in the fall in that part of the world. Green tailed towhee. Bang. We were speculating about yesterday about the value of red eyes, and I actually don't know if there is any selective value. Anybody know about red eyes? Going to have to look that one up. Spotted towhee. Now, leaving the Passerella day, right, to some of these related species, no, nobody mistakes this for a sparrow, I don't think. Again, the reason I put it in and we look at immatures and uh, females, they, they're kind of sparrow-like. Lazuli, lazuli, bunting. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Where it all started, how sparrow? Well, this guy. Lapland longspur. Good, yeah. And the longspurs are all gorgeous in breeding plumage and all impossible in, in wintering plumage or, or difficult anyway. 
And like I said, this is, this is like your free space in the middle of the bingo card. <laughs> Not going to be confused with anything, so we, but we'll throw it in just to give ourselves some breathing room. All right, so um, I, I think all those males, as I uh, said earlier, are, are unmistakable. If you get a good look at them, even if you don't know anything about birds, if you get into the sparrow section of your field guide and you saw, you saw them at all, um, you'll be able to pick those birds out and go, oh yeah, yeah, that was pretty obvious what that was. Comes a nice wood duck sneaking in over here. See if he looks in the window. Okay, so the ones we just talked about then that are, uh, I call unmistakable, are here in the brown. So we've already dealt with those. Now the next group, which is, we already dealt with about half. Now I think there's a whole another third that are, I would call distinctive, and that's these. American tree, chipping fox, sagebrush, song, Lincoln swamp, and then both finch, uh, house and Casson's finch. So let's look at those. Uh, and now I'll, I'll start pointing out some of the field marks uh, on the, that I didn't on the earlier ones just to show you what, uh, what are the things that make these distinctive. So for this species, we're still in quiz mode here, uh, these white wing bars, bicolored bill, if you can see it, unstreaked breast and dark spot. And when you've got, when you've got all that together, you know you have a tree sparrow. Right, American tree sparrow. There are other tree sparrows in the world. That's why this is our American tree sparrow. Looks pretty similar generally. White eyebrow, rufous cap, another unstreaked breast, no stick pin. I might say also this is quite small. Right, chipping sparrow. Streaky breast, heavy streaks, rounded head, gray, not striped, and usually a reddish tail and rump contrasting with a grayish back and head. What do you think? Fox. Fox. And this is the, one of those species that varies enormously across its range. This is the slate, slate colored form. Uh, so here's just one of the plates out of one of the sparrow books. So here's thick builds, there's our slate colored, sooty, red. And uh, you can get an idea in looking through some of these books and getting on the web how much these things vary between reddish, brown, and gray across their range. Ours, is, again, is the gray one. And here is the, the new range map in the latest edition of Nat Geo that I was talking about that shows where these different forms are found. Look at the variation just going down the Alaskan coast. There's all of these different, different plumages all the way down the coast. So here's our Shistace, uh slate colored group here in the better part of the Intermountain West. But Here's a form here and here's a form right here as well. Different form over here. All the red ones are up here in the boreal. So again, the, the guide has really got everything you need uh, as far as sort of the range of where these varieties are. All right, well, everybody knows what this is by now, probably. Uh, gray head and neck, white eye ring, uh, nice little black mustache and a white throat. But the field mark that I can see the farthest is this contrast right here. This gray head and this brown back. When they're out in the sagebrush, if they're even facing, when they're facing away from you, obviously you get the best look. Even if they're at some distance, you can see that contrast right away, and you know it's not a vesper sparrow, it's not a brewer's sparrow, it's not a black-throated sparrow, it's not a lark sparrow. Uh, I think this is a great, great field mark, brown to gray. Okay, this guy, somebody's favorite bird. Brown and gray striped head, stick pin, streaking on the sides, and they've been singing out here. I can hear them through the window. Song sparrow. Uh, seems like we can run into song sparrows along the Boise River and up in Hulls Gulch any time of the year. And I wouldn't be surprised at any given time to hear them singing either. So I turn my phone off. Oops, sorry. Banging on the microphone. I'm going to turn my phone off before I forget here. And again, one of, the, one of these species has a, a great deal of variation, and you go to the sparrow specialty books, um, 
sparrows that the U.S. and Canada, the two I showed you I've got here, if you want to look at them, have the, uh, the variations in the song sparrows. And again, the, the range maps in the, uh, the back of the Nat Geo guide. So here's our bird. Again, pretty much the Intermountain West type. And then you've got these variations, again, on the coast, quite a bit of variation going up, up and down the coast, which is pretty interesting. Because that happens, this happens for several different species. Going from Alaska to Baja, you get all these plumage variations. Same for white crown sparrows, uh, especially the songs of white crown sparrows, uh, vary in a dialect fashion as you go down the coast. Okay, one of RL's favorites. Um, usually in the breeding season, uh, the best field mark for me are, is this contrast right here. They have very fine streaks, and it's kind of roof, not rufous, uh, real buffy here. And then it's a real sh pretty sharp break to the white. So this is a really good field mark. Um, gray eyebrow. And anybody but RL? Lincoln. Lincoln's, yep. All right, here's one that we don't see a lot of. Um, reddish crown, white throat, and these reddish wings show up pretty nicely. If you can get a look at them, they're a little bit of a skulker. How about this one? Swamp. Swamp. Good. Okay, leaving the uh, passerella day again, getting over into the finches, uh, probably everybody will realize what this is. Um, always pretty heavily streaked. Of course, this color can vary a lot, and I, I haven't seen so many recently, but in the past, I've, in my yard, I've had yellow and orange birds, not just red birds. The red can vary a lot from pretty intense to not much. Uh, but what's really a good field mark is this curved upper bill that shows up really well in silhou silhouette or at some distance. If it's got its side to you, you can see it looks like a kind of like a parrot bill. And I found that's, that's pretty handy. The other uh, finch in the group, usually a pretty red cap. And what I like, and this picture is, isn't even actually the best. I couldn't find a perfect picture of this. But this white, broad kind of white um, eye, eyebrow goes across the side of the head, really shows up well in most individuals. Um, this little brown spot here, mallard stripe unstreaked below, and if you can see the tail from the right angle, notched tail. Gasson's finch. Okay, so there are the unmistakable and the distinctive. So, if we, again, looking at breeding males, what, what we're left with that might be confusing, and I, I'm saying there's only 15% here that are really, can be pretty confusing. Um, among the adult males. So we've got grasshopper, vesper, savanna, and oh, brewers. So these are the, uh, the little brown birds right here. <laughs> and, uh, but I think, uh, as you'll see, they're also, they also have plenty of field marks to tell them apart, if you can see them. And of course, it always comes back to getting a good look and uh, being patient. And again, I would argue having uh, the best optics you can afford. So grasshopper sparrows are in this group that have this really distinctive profile. They they're, have a flat head that goes almost straight into the bill. It's quite unlike the other sparrows. Uh, this orange spot usually shows up right here in front of, behind the bill. Uh, if you can get this angle on them and see this dark crown with this stripe down the middle, that's helpful. Uh, the buffy breast and sides, I don't know, a lot of sparrows have buffy breast and sides, so I don't get too excited about that one. But these other field marks are pretty good. And of course, once you, as we look later, once you put it together with song and habitat, then, then you're going to find it's, it's not hard to tell at all. OK, brewers, but the other uh, great sagebrush bird. Uh, little tiny fine white eye ring, finely streaked crown. And you, you can really see this if you, if you look at these birds and spend a, a moment with them. Very plain breast. A little bit of a whitish eyebrow, although I'm not sure that's uh, so great. Uh, but the streaked back is also helpful as the bird turns. Look, see if the back is streaked or solid. The other bird that's very often out in the sagebrush country, especially higher elevation, uh, Vesper sparrow. 
This shoulder patch is pretty reliable in my experience. I mean, it's just a brown bird. It's like, eh, not too much going on. But if you can see that little reddish shoulder patch, and of course the white outer tail feathers, looks very much like a junco. And so when they're, as soon as they fly, you've got white outer tail feathers and a brown bird. You either have a vesper sparrow or the lark sparrow, but the lark sparrow has big corner spots and not just little lines on the tail. They're big corner spots and really a lot of white. So those tails are pretty different. And again, another little fine eye ring that sometimes doesn't show up that great on these brown birds. And then this really interesting um, pattern right here where you got this white going way back around this dark spot on the ear that's, that's pretty good. But I still think the shoulder patch and the tail feathers will give you your Vesper sparrows. So another bird out there among these confusing ones, uh, savanna sparrows. Usually they have some yellow right here. So again, if you can get any kind of look at them and you got a little streaky brown sparrow, see if you can pick off that yellow. A um, little streaky on the side, so they've got that kind of uh, song sparrow look really. Probably, that's probably what's confused with most, song sparrow. But not, not such heavy streaking. They may or may not have a stick pin. I've seen both ways. And then a um, bit of a, uh, a spot again behind the eye that, that you can see it on both of these pictures that should show up pretty well. Once again, habitat and song will be better than all of these field marks for this species. And we'll get to that. All right, unmistakable females. So for several of these species, the males and females are the same. So we've already, we've already nailed them, right? Black-throated sparrows, the same. Lark sparrows, the females are the same. We'll look at these that are, are different but still distinctive. White crowns are the same, golden crowns, Harris's, white throats, green-tailed towhees. The sexes are the same, so we've already covered them and you don't have to worry about those. They'll be easy. So we'll look at the ones that are just a little bit different. Getting back to our, what do you think this is? Big white wing patches, heavy black mallar, chunky. Lark bunting. So I would argue that it's, it's different than the male, but it's still unmistakable, especially if you can get this bird to fly. Uh, the, this is really dramatic. These white wing patches are very dramatic. Of course, dark eyed junco, very similar, might be a little bit lighter. There's so much variation in the juncos around here. Uh, you know, th th I think they're all pretty, pretty obvious. Uh, same with the uh, tohi. Females are going to be very similar in pattern, pretty distinctive, long tail, rufous sides, a lot of patterning in the wings in the back. And then, mm -hmm. again, the freebie, snow bunting. Different from the male, but also you're not going to confuse this with any other bird, at least in this hemisphere, or the other, I think. Okay, moving to a group that's a little bit more difficult, the female, uh, breeding females that are, I would say, distinctive. So, okay, here's the ones we already covered that are either the same as the males or are distinctive enough. So the next group then of distinctive females, these in blue, tree sparrow, chippery, fox, sagebrush, song, Lincoln swamp, and on down the line. So we'll look at adult females. So I throw in this um, female bunting because I've seen people uh, call this a sparrow uh, up at foothills quite a bit. And one of the things about these female buntings, and there's if you go down into Mexico, you can have five, five buntings uh, overlapping in the winter. Um, lazuli, indigo, painted, varied, and the Mexican species, blue bunting. And all of the females and juveniles have this sort of rich, cinnamony, rufousy coloration, and not, and not streaks. There's like no, no streaks on these birds. So you get this sort of solid, plain, but richly colored bird it's most likely going to be a, a female bunting. And around here, we just have lazulis. Um, you can also see this buffy, fat buffy wing bar uh, pretty easily in most birds. The head's shaped a little differently, and there are some other cues. But just that overall coloration, the kind of the plainness of it is, is really good. Back to our house finch. Probably everybody's looked at plenty of these, sort of know what we're talking about. Again, that bill, the heavy streaking, and just brown. 
uh, uniform brown all over it. It's not doesn't get very richly colored. Uh, there's not variation over the bird. It's just sort of an all brown streaked bird. Cassin's finch again a little a uh, little different deal, and I really like this whitish broad whitish eyebrow that shows on most females. If you can get a look at the head at all, you'll see similar streaking, but not the same as house finches. A notch tail. Uh, it seems to have a little bit longer tail, but but that head pattern is really, or, or I should say face. The face is really good. Um, probably everybody knows a house sparrow when they see it. Um, fairly heavy bill in comparison to our other sparrows. Also a whitish eyebrow, but not streaked. Okay, females that are readily confused. So again, we're down to 19% of these species that I would argue are, can be pretty easily confused. We need to look a little more closely. Grasshopper, Brewers, Vesper, Savannah, and Lapland. But again, we've already talked about uh, grasshopper sparrows, brewers sparrows, and vesper sparrows, and savannah sparrows. And since the, male, uh, the females are the, the same, uh, once you've got that species figured out, you don't have to worry about whether it's male or female. So all that leaves, really, is uh, Lapland longspur. Now, um, Again, a big, broad, roughy uh, eyebrow and white outer tail feathers. All these, these can be kind of hard to see sometimes. They're not quite as flashy as, as our juncos. They kind of can keep them hidden. There's not as much white. And, uh, but a really nice triangular ear patch on the side of the head. So when you're looking at these brown, kind of semi-streaky birds out in the field, try to get a good look at that, that face and see what kind of pattern you can see. And of course, the tail's always good if you can pick up white or not in the tail. That'll be very helpful. So, in other words, one, one species of breeding females that I think uh, might be confused with something else because they're not very distinctive. Okay, uh, now we move on to immatures, and now it's going to get a little uh, dicier. Um, I, I see. Uh, Immature and juvenile used in a lot of different ways in a lot of different places. So I just went to eBird to see what they say because they've got a category. Um, they've got categories for everything basically. And what, so what they say is when in doubt, use immature for any bird that is not an adult. Juvenile is a more specific, describing a bird still in its juvenile plumage. And this plumage is held only briefly for many songbirds. Some maybe just a few weeks after leaving the nest. And I, in fact, I found it very difficult to find pictures of birds in juvenile plumage on the internet. You can find everything else easily, but people are not getting juvenile sparrows much. So if you want your niche uh, and want to be famous <laughs> on Idaho Birding Facebook page, uh, and I, I could not find a picture, uh, I could not find a picture of any description of a juvenile green-tailed towhee. All there are are drawings. It's like, hmm, might have to go up in the mountain shrub and uh, get down on the Ceanothus and crawl around uh, on my hands and knees and see if I can get a, a picture because it's going to be the only one apparently. And uh, this plume is lasting up to a year for larger birds like hawks, but of course we're in the sparrow world where they're in this juvenile plumage and they quickly move into immature plumage. So, we call, so I decided well, I'll call everything immature. So unmistakable immatures, not too many. And of course this is probably where we start. Uh, getting into that group of birds where we look at them, we just go, I don't know. It's a little brown bird. So we can work through some of these. Um, the white crowned immatures, I think, are actually pretty distinctive. Uh, they still got that big, uh, boldly striped head, plain breast, and uh, that pale, contrasty bill. So I think we're not going to have trouble with him. Uh, immature Harris sparrows. Now, these guys, the ones I've seen um, in this part of the world in the winter are not in this plumage. They're already in uh, adult wintering plumage. But uh, it's possible, I suppose, in the fall we could end up with a immature Harris sparrow. Uh, this speckled crown, again, the contrasty bill, it's a zonotrichia. This spot on the side of the face, kind of a plain face with a spot. And it looks like they all have what we're used to seeing is some kind of a black necklace with a little, maybe a little pendant on it. 
And we, when we look at the wintering adult plumage, that shows up really, really well. But I think this, is, this bird's going to jump out a little bit. I don't think it's going to be so easily overlooked as some of the others. Um, I finally scrounged out an immature green-tailed towhee from uh, Heidi because uh, they had got it in a net. And this bird, I think you would have no trouble telling as a green-tailed toy because of this, this sort of electric iridescent <coughs> yellow-green that they have. But this bird, or in this light, that's, uh, that's a puzzle bird right there. You know, I'm not sure I would have known what it was unless uh, you can see quite clearly it has such a long tail. So that's an interesting one, immature green-tailed towhees. Uh, I was surprised how hard it was to find a picture of an immature spotted towhee. Um, this bird looks like it's, it's pretty ratty looking. Uh, you got the nice long tail feathers that we're used to in our towhees, uh, a brownish head, really heavy streaks on a kind of a very rich buffy uh, background. And I'm not sure I've ever actually seen an immature spotted towhee. When I started looking at the pictures, I'm not sure I've ever seen one. So uh, that's kind of fun. Yay, and the freebie. <laughs> Look at, it's so cool, isn't it? It's like a little, I don't know what, a little tiny dog of some kind or something. It's so, so cuddly looking. <laughs> Snow buntings, yay. Okay, so those were the few immatures that I think are uh, maybe if not unmistakable, at least distinctive. So let's look at a few more. So some more birds that I think are pretty distinctive as immatures here in the blue. We'll look at each one of those. Uh, again, the grasshopper sparrow, that flat head going into the straight bill and the chestnut spot, also showing up on the, on the immatures. So that's, you want to look at that head. If you think you've got uh, a grasshopper sparrow out there, look at the shape and look for that spot. Um, the, again, the buffy, eh, a lot of birds have buffy. That might help or maybe not. Uh, and I think this is pretty good. Again, I haven't seen a lot of these birds um, since I left North Dakota out here. Uh, looking for these scaly upper parts. So not, not streaked, not solid, but literally scaly. The uh, black-throated sparrow is looking pretty distinctive to me because of this really contrasty white eyebrow on a generally plain gray head, no streaks, no spots, just uh, kind of like a really watered down version of the, of the uh, adult, male or female. Um, a white throat, buffy wing bars, and I think that'll be, uh, that one too will be pretty easy. Again, once you combine it with the habitat, then you'll probably be able to pick this guy off pretty easily. Uh, lark sparrow, face something like the adult, in uh, not nearly as bold, but it's still kind of got big hunks of white and brown going from the top of the head down through there. So that's pretty distinctive, and again, the big white corners on the tail feathers are going to be the best, best field mark for this guy. Lark bunting, chunky, chunky, chunky. It's just got a really different shape, and that's, I think, uh, what jumps off. Again, the big white wing patch that will show up even in this perch bird, and as soon as it flies, just like the female, you're going to see big white wing patches in a brown bird. And then you pretty well are going to have that one figured out. This is another bird I don't think I've seen very many of, immature juncos. They must molt into adult plumage uh, pretty early in the season. Of course, the white outer tail feathers are always good for, um, for juncos. Uh, and then just sort of dusky brown and streaked overall, which isn't very helpful since we've already said a lot of our sparrows have that sort of general look. <laughs> so I think with, with habitat and the white outer tail feathers, uh, if you're up, um, you know, in bogus in the late summer and you've got several s different sparrows sort of flocking up, uh, you can pick these guys out of, say, the song sparrows and certainly the white crowns or others that are around there. Golden crowned sparrow immatures. Um, I think this, this is the bird I had at bogus this fall. One, just one individual. This head, even though it's the size and shape and same genus as the white crowned sparrow, the, the head is very different. It doesn't have those bold streaks. It has that uh, little bit of a yellow. Just, a, again, a subdued version of the adult. Once again, 
How useful that is, I don't know, dusky streaking on the breast and sides. Quite a few sparrows have that. But at least it's not a plain, a, a clear breast that would allow you to separate it from uh, where you'd know you had a white crown, for example. The uh, white-throated sparrows, I ran into a lot of these this fall in Wisconsin. This uh, spot by the bill seemed to be on most birds. Uh, not the little white throat, not the sharp white throat you get in the adult white throats, but uh, nonetheless, a, a little bit of a clear white patch on the throat that, that shows up. And then these buffy edges here on the coverts that almost look like a wing bar, not quite, but uh, kind of give you this wing bar uh, look. Back to our long spur, again this, this uh, ear patch that's sort of outlined, dark uh, ear patch outlined by light is a good one. The uh, bold streak backs uh, may, up, may show up well if you, you know, get the right angle on it, but I, I like the head because a lot of times these guys are out in the field with horn larks and they're down low and they're in stubble and they'll just poke their heads up and look at you and then go back to scuttling around so you can get, maybe get a look at the side of the head. Uh, more than the rest of the bird on, on long spurs in winter, especially. And then back to house sparrow, again, stout bill, big white eye, uh, eye line over the plain breast, and pretty, pretty different general shape from these others. Well, let's see, where are we on time? Is there a clock in here? 148. 148. Let's just, uh, let's go through this bit and then maybe we'll take a little break. Uh, so, confusing immatures. So quite a few of them actually can be quite uh, arguably confusing. So this is another one of those birds, kind of like Harris sparrows, that probably when they get to Idaho, they don't look like this. They've already molted out of this juvenile, or uh, I should say immature plume, plumage. I mean, it looks like a little tiny uh, female red-winged blackbird, doesn't it? I, again, I'm not sure I've ever seen this, this plumage of this bird because I've not been up in the uh, taiga in, in late summer where they would be running around. But if you think you've got a tiny red-winged blackbird female, it's probably an immature tree sparrow down here really, really early. I mean, look at the heavy, heavy streaking on this thing. It's really, uh, really pretty amazing. Uh, young chippies, those are, these are really kind of nice surprise uh, birds for people who aren't used to seeing them. They're easy to see because they're around like Foothills Learning Center. When they, as soon as they come out of the nest, you see them around town. And they look kind of unlike the adults with all these spots. You know, the adults are real clean and kind of grayish. So these guys are all spotted. They've got this little eye line, this little kind of punky do with some streaks in it. Uh, but this line going all the way from the bill all the way back through, and again, a small sparrow often on the ground running around. Be pretty easy to, what we got out there? House sparrows? Pretty easy to pick out. Uh, immature brewer sparrows, if you're out running around the sagebrush in late summer, you run into these guys. The uh, sort of fine streaking, and, but that crown, just like the adults, you know, really fine streaking through the crown. It's very, sort of reminds me of a gadwall head uh, in some ways. Uh, immature fox sparrows, head very much like the adult, big, dark, sort of unmarked, not like a song sparrow. It's got kind of bold streaks or fine streaks or anything else, kind of a solid head, and then this kind of uh, almost watercolor blotching on the uh, underparts. And again, with habitat and elevation, um, probably be able to f figure those out. Uh, sagebrush sparrows, immatures, same kind of eye ring as the adult, but notice you don't have that really nice brown to gray, gray contrast to work with, with the gray head and the brown back. A little bit of a whitish throat and buffy wing bars. And out in the sagebrush. This is, all these birds uh, like this, you know, more, more and more of the habitat helps you figure out which one you've got. Uh, Vesper immature, the Vespers are really good for their nice clear um, Eye rings, uh, white outer tail feathers, the best field marks. And I don't know how good this is. I've never used it. I just noticed that it was in the, one of the guides. Are these, these feathers right here that have these really black, almost black centers with buffy, buffy edges, which probably will show up reasonably well in 
the next time I'm out there with these guys, I'm going to look for those feathers because I have not used that. Savannah's, another one with an eye ring, median uh, crown stripe, and this very streaky, like uh, kind of like a song sparrow. Uh, may or may not have a stick pin in the juvenile. So this is a this is, can be a tricky one to tell from a from a juvenile song sparrow. Again, habitat will do it though because you're not usually going to find vesper sparrows with song sparrows. And here's so those two look at how. Uh, how similar these guys are. So these guys um, would take a little bit of detective work to figure out what you're looking at. Um, doesn't have anywhere near the sort of bold markings the, the adult do. It's just, again, sort of a washed out version of an adult. Easily confused, I think, with, uh, with Vesper and maybe a couple of others. Lincolns. Um, there, again, another bird that looks a lot like the previous two. Habitat's going to really help with these guys. Um, they don't, these don't show the nice crisp break the adults have between the streaking and the white. So you've just got another kind of streaky, blurry, brownish sparrow. So these, these are the tough ones that probably can be the hardest ones to tell. Um, again, we're going to rely pretty heavily on habitat. And there may be some adults hanging around with these juveniles too. So kind of look at the whole group and see if you can pick off uh, maybe adults still feeding them or still hanging around. That can help. And then Swamp Sparrow, uh, real dark streaks on the head, the little white unmarked throat, and e like the adult, some rusty or rich brown in the, when the adults, it's a good part of the wing has that rusty, rich color, and the juvenile's just um, less, but it's still pretty contrasty with the other brown colors on the bird. Unlike all those previous three or four that are just kind of house finch brown with not much not much contrast, not much richness in the feathers. And then back to our uh, leaving our passerella day over to the lazuli, lazuli bunting. Uh, very much like the female except with some faint uh, streaking, but again that real plain head and kind of a uniform all overall brownish color with not, not much streaking, much, not much drama in anything about the plumage. House finch uh, immature, just almost exactly like the female, just uniformly brown, uniformly streaked, once again the bill. So telling a female from a juvenile house finch is probably not an not a easy enterprise. So um, good luck. Um, Casson's finch, for the third time, I point out how valuable this broad whitish eye line is on these guys. You can really tell them apart from all these other streaky brown birds because they don't have that in the face. We'll talk about some winter plumages now. Um, in, so in general, you probably already know this, that uh, winter plumages are generally similar to female or immature, and sometimes they're all the same. Uh, they're usually duller. Uh, they can be buffier. And, um, but some of the key field marks uh, persist in these plumages as well. So again, going back to our fox sparrow, uh, looking for that uniform gray head, big, big spots. Uh, interesting that in the winter time, and I didn't know this until I put this talk together, uh, that they go to a more of a yellowish bill versus a blue gray bill when they're breeding, which almost seems like the opposite of what you'd do uh, if you wanted to be fancy, but they have their fancy bill in the winter time. So I didn't know that. I'm gonna be, that's one thing I'm going to be looking for on my next fox sparrow. Uh, so here's the Harris's sparrow that we saw at Hull's Gulch, and we normally will see is the not the juve, not the immature plumage, but the wintering plumage. So they lose their um, kind of fancy um, coloration and keep this little necklace and this spotted head, contrasty bill, big sparrow, pretty much unmistakable. <laughs> 